Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Icebreakers Game Dev Chat. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about narrative de uh, design. And uh, my name is Sylvia Duer, and I work for Nonita, the Norwegian network for video game companies, set in Norway, of course. And Icebreakers is a collaboration between IGDA Finland, Sweden, and Nonita Norway to discuss different parts of the game develop or different parts of game development in the Nordics. Hel, who's usually here, my co-host from Finland, uh, couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately, as he has gotten ill, and we wish him a speedy recovery. But before we begin, I'd like to please uh, welcome our guests here tonight, and if uh, you might be able to do a small little introduction of yourselves, uh, Jorori. Yeah, hi, my name is Jorori De Jesus. Uh, I am a game developer from the U.S., uh, currently living in Helsinki, working at Housemark. I've previously worked at Respawn. Um, and Scopely and EA, I've worked on projects like Madden, Marvel, Star Wars, and uh, narrative design is my passion. It's uh, one of my favorite. It's what got. It's why I do games in the first place to tell stories. So, yeah, that's me. Oh, I guess I should also mention I'm on. I am one of the board members for Global Game Jam as well. So, if you have questions about that, feel free to message me. And Ace. Not going to be quite as impressive, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Ace or uh, Ausdorch. Um, uh, yeah, I've been working for a year and a half in the industry for Mirkut Games, my standard game studio. Uh, and I currently work from Denmark remotely. Um, so we've got a lot of the Nordics represented here tonight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I also did my BA in Norway as well, so I've been kind of in a Nordic circle. <laughs> um, yeah, I also did a year and a half of teaching in Norway uh, mm. before I went on to do my uh, master's in the UK. And yeah, that's uh, most of me. Well, we're very grateful to have both of you here tonight joining us. Um, so the topic of our episode tonight is narrative design. I think it's a, a topic that a lot of people including myself, have kind of misunderstood. Um, so because when I think of the, when the first time I heard the, the name or the word narrative designer or the title narrative designer, I thought, oh, they're the people that write things for the stories. Like they write the stories, right? <laughs> and then I saw the, the t and then I saw the title writer and I was like, oh, I'm very confused right now. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from both of you about what it is exactly that narrative designers do. Um, so before we start with the questions, I just want to know that for those of you watching us at home, uh, thank you for watching. But also, if you have any questions, please ask in the chat. We are watching it, and we would love to have your questions for our speakers tonight. So, all right, let's start. So, Jorori, can you tell me a little bit about what is, narr what is narrative design in games? Oh, it's everything. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm being <laughs> uh, narrative design is the bridge between what a writer does and what a game designer does it takes the story at, written on paper and actually implements it in terms of how the player experiences that story so it's it's the things like audio logs and um you know other narrative systems to deliver that story it's cinematics it's everything story related that the player is going to interact with and even some lore details that they may never interact with that help explain bits of what you're doing to the team. OK. Do you have anything to add to that, Ace? No, I pretty much covered the entire thing. Uh, I think for the most part, at least. Uh, yeah. Well, OK, lucky, so lucky then, I, then I have a question that's a little bit from the, the person that doesn't really know much about narrative design. So do you do any of the writing itself for the stories? What is it that you do? Like, what, what is the writing that you do for the narration part? Ace, if you want to start, and then I'll follow. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it differs a lot between uh, narrative designers. And for me, being a narrative tech designer, uh, I do some writing, but it's uh, limited. And what I have done, <laughs> can't really talk about much uh -huh. uh, on my for, for my current project. But uh, I think it differs a lot between narrative designers. Some are purely in the design. Some dabble a bit in the writing, and some are a lot more involved in writing than uh, others are. But that's kind of what I experienced, at least. 
Yeah, and I want to echo that. It I think it really depends on the studio too. Um, in smaller studios, a narrative designer is more likely to also be a writer. Um, the more AAA you get, the more specialized you get. Um, and in my experience, like I respawn, I was like, hey, I want to do writing. They, it was not part expected that I would do writing, but uh, my background is in anthropology with a background uh, with a minor in creative writing. So um, I was really I really wanted to do and put that writing degree to use. Um, so I did some punch up on barks. Uh, for those who don't know what barks are, they're the things that NPCs and sometimes the player will shout out at random. They're not really at random. They're based on certain criteria. Um, so when you fight Zeke right outside the cantina in Jedi Survivor, all those lines or most of those lines were lines I wrote. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. But that actually works really well for my next question to you, which is how did you end up getting into narrative design? Because anthropology is not what I would expect is the usual way into get, getting into narrative design. Um, I, I I think Ace might be able to answer this question better than me because I've had a very unusual route. Um, but I started, I got into games in like 2016, 2017 um, as a hobbyist. Uh, for a year before that um because I, I i went to do a, a a phd and realized i hated academia and did not want to be there anymore so i dropped out of my my anthropology phd and needed something to do so i learned to code um and i was a decent coder not a good one so when i actually went back to grad school to get a master's in game development they were like well you're not good enough to be a programmer, but maybe you could be a tech designer. And that was sort of my, you know, when I really wanted to do narrative and story and I talked to the administration, they're like, well, tech design is probably going to set you up very nicely for narrative because it'll teach you how to implement narrative stuff. I was like, cool, perfect. Um, and my first two jobs were as tech designer. So on Madden 20, I was a technical designer for the narrative team. And on Scopely, I was just a tech designer, but I kept bugging them to let me in the writer's room uh, <laughs> until eventually they did. And um, after that, I got the job on Star Wars as an actual narrative designer because of the background I had and, and the work I did on Madden specifically. Um, and th the rest, I've just been doing that ever since. Oh, that's a really interesting background. How about you, Ace? I, I like how you said I might have a more regular way. I don't. I really don't. <laughs> um, so I, I did uh, both a bachelor's and a master's in game design and development, like generalist kind of stuff. So I learned everything, um, except I don't think I ever took a class in anything related to narrative design. Um, <laughs> uh, during my master's, I was focusing on level design and environment art. Um, and I applied to Mercury Games, where I work now, as a level designer and was rejected uh, because they found some more qualified level designers. And then a month later, they contacted me again and asked me if I wanted to uh, take on a role as a narrative tech designer, which was a role I had never heard of before. And I said, yes, because it sounded interesting. Um, and I am really glad for it uh, because I, I enjoy it a lot more than level design, to be honest. Uh, so not, not a very regular route either, I think. Uh, it was very I accidental. I don't think I know anyone who like, is like, yes, I'm going to be a narrative designer and just got the job that way. You need to have a, a really strange route into it. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to asking, asking you more, a little, uh, more about that because, uh, like I said, narrative design is something I really know so little about. Um, can, can you tell me a little bit about what your day looks like as working as a narrative designer? Or a narrative tech designer? Yeah, um, uh, sure. I'll start. Um, I a lot of my uh, I'm also a tech narrative designer for uh, for the record. Um, so like my day is probably less like a normal narrative designer's as well. Um, but like I start my day, I check my my production tasks right. So I look for any existing bugs that I need to clean up. Um, a lot of what I do involves taking the voiceover that we have um, and actually like putting it in the game and scripting the events that trigger the cinematics and trigger the voiceover and 
and pacing it so that it feels good and and uh like there was a whole month on jedi where we had to go in and, and like fine tune the like 0.3 seconds of a pause between lines so that the dialogue felt natural and it was it was no one looked forward to that it was like the one thing we're like okay well we got to get it done so we're all going to take a chunk of this and it's going to be miserable what we're going to do <laughs> So well, like, so you know, that's a part of the job is to fine tune the timing. Mm-hmm. Oh wow! Okay, that's that that's real. Uh, when when you have a dialogue heavy game, ooh, yeah, because <laughs> uh, you know what the sound engineer records is usually a fine performance, but like mm-hmm. the audio may have a delay at the end, and you have to trim that off so that the pacing of the or or add extra. It might cut off. To, right as the line ends and then the next line fires it doesn't feel like a natural conversation stuff like that that's so interesting do you do the same type of job ace it's definitely a part of it yes um my day-to-day is probably a bit more strange like because we are a fairly small company uh, um relatively uh mid-sized company so i tend to take on a couple of other hats as well um but uh my day to day is different. Uh, every single day is something different. Um, but I've spent spent one day maybe creating narrative tools. The other day I'm prototyping gameplay elements that serve some narrative purpose. Um, or I spend the day doing level design because that's needed. Uh, but yeah, every day is a little bit different. But I do. Uh, those uh, things that uh, Jerry was talking about, uh, all the pacing and timing those are sadly a very large chunk of our work. Mm-hmm. Uh, just getting the pacing just right. And uh, especially when you have um, other things like if you have interrupts and uh, you can, if you can queue up dialogue, it becomes even stranger to pace. Um, yep. But yeah. I gave you a, a fun aside. One of the fun things about working in VO is when they, because a lot of times we don't have the voice actors casted right away, so we'll have to like get temp VO in there somehow, and you get kind of used to hearing that. Um, and then they real actors come in, and you're like, "Who is a stranger in my home?" <laughs> <laughs> Actual yeah. professionals? What is this? <laughs> but I, I got to ask them because you're talking about it, uh, uh, some parts of your job that are a little bit. Not as fun. Do you have any parts of the job that you think are the most fun? Or like, what is your favorite part of the job? Oh, I love world building. Um, Uh That's one of my favorite aspects. And like, building tools that like actually automate most of that manual stuff, right? Like, that's that's a big part of the job where you just kind of go in and like, okay, these are pain points. How do I make this so that I push a button? It doesn't. I actually did this on Madden as a tech designer. Um, we had a ton of cutscenes, and we had to get them in, in engine and uh, from a text script into engine. And I simply wrote code to like push a button and do it, and that was really rewarding. Um, but like when a world building is probably my favorite aspect of narrative design, where it's like coming up with mechanics and reasons for why those mechanics exist in the world or why certain things are the way they are. Um, it's not so much writing the minute by minute dialogue, but providing background for the writer to actually utilize in writing that dialogue. Um, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And how about you, Ace? Uh, Similar, actually, I, uh, probably one of the most satisfying things is creating a good tool (laughs) as, uh, as boring as it sounds when you create a nice tool that like saves you tons of time in the future. It is incredibly satisfying when it works. Mm. Uh, that is probably my favorite thing, at least. Um, all the narrative things, great fun as well, but mm, it doesn't beat making a good tool. But then that wor- works perfectly into my next se- section because you're both, your titles, the both of you have titles, narrative tech designers or tech narrative designers. Can you tell me a little bit about the difference between the, ro- the two roles? What is a tech designer? So a technical designer is someone who um, is basically like a hybrid programmer designer. Mm-hmm. Um, and a, narr- a tech narrative designer is someone who can, is basically a narrative designer who can also code is the best way to explain it, or at least script. Mm-hmm. 
So they're they're doing a lot more pipeline work to make other narrative designers' lives easier if you're working on a team with others, or to make your life easier if you're the only narrative designer on the team. Any any comments to that, Ace? Oh yeah, it's that's pretty accurate. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's also hard to say for me because we, uh, our, um, our narrative team is uh, me and two writers. Um, <laughs> But uh, the writers also do some of the roles of a narrative designer. So I am somewhat unclear on what a pure narrative designer would be doing, to be perfectly yeah. honest. Uh, I might have a little insight. If you, like yeah. On certain games, you can look at systems and, and definitely tell when a narrative designer was, had their hands in it. Uh, for I'm a huge Persona 5 fan. Um, the confidant system is definitely something that a narrative designer had a heavy hand in. Like, I, without looking at, at the production and knowing anything about what actually happened there, I'd bet my last dollar that some narrative designer was was heavily involved there. You can write that, that down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really, I think that's really, really interesting that you can spot those kind of things in games. Um, so, um, both of you work as tech narrative designers, and I was wondering... You you work at a or you've had a Jorori, you've had a lot of experience at bigger studios and and Ace you've been at a somewhat medium sized studio that's somewhat um, uh, or has a, a little um, is a little smaller of course <laughs> and I was wondering because we've talked about this a little bit your role uh, Ace is very mixed with a lot of different roles and Jorori is your role specifically that or do you end up blending into other roles as well? Um. My, I, I think in working in AAA, my role has become more specialized. Um, anything it blends into is because I wanted it. Um, right, there's just so much work to get done on a AAA production, and narrative is one of those things that most studios, unfortunately, kind of think about last. Uh, maybe, maybe not last. Audio, probably then narrative. <laughs> in my experience right but like it, it tends to be uh an afterthought for a lot of studios so um you know a good studio will integrate the narrative with the, with the gameplay and and make the story and and like the verbs themselves feel like part of the story um you know i, I this is my biggest complaint about uh the uncharted franchise um you know nathan drake's supposed to be this like goofy likable scoundrel of a character but he's also kind of committing genocide in every game so it's mm. you know kind of hard to <laughs> hard to balance that out yeah. and and ace how do you feel about having to mix up the roles a little bit i really like it uh, i enjoy chaos mm. in my life <laughs> I, I like it when all of my days are different and i have no idea what i'm walking into uh, every day at work i I really enjoy it. Um, uh, yeah, doing a little bit of this and that every day, I no complaints. Um, so uh, I'd like to go on to then uh, talking a little bit about uh, the kind of roles that uh, lead you to narrative design or the roles that you can go to from narrative design. And I was wondering, I mean, from, based on your experiences, you've talked a little bit about it, but it from your experiences, what have you seen other people going from to get to narrative design? Like, what kind of roles? Is it normally students that go straight into narrative design? Is it usually somebody that has experience doing something else? What kind of roles normally lead to narrative design? I think uh, Jeruri has a similar idea with me. Just <laughs> doing this when it said students usually don't go straight into narrative design, which I think is very true. Um, uh, I am very much a special case, I think, because uh, I came straight out of school into narrative tech design. But I think that's uh, very uncommon uh, for the most part. There are definitely junior narrative design roles out there, but I feel like they are very sparse, um, which is sad, but uh, it's the reality of it. Um, but most of what I've heard of is uh, people going from either a game design background or a just pure writing background into narrative design. That's most of what I've heard, at least. Um, those are usually people with extensive game design background or extensive writing backgrounds. Hmm. 
Yeah, um, I think th that's a really accurate assessment. Uh, students, it's like if you're if you, if you're a student into narrative design, you you have got the golden ticket. Like uh. you, you won the lottery um, because everyone wants this job in this industry for some reason. I, I don't know why. Like it's a fun job. Don't get me wrong, but like. I think like this and concept art are two of the most competitive uh, positions in this industry um, because they, they have this like glamour, I think associated with them. So as a student, you're not, uh, you're not just competing against other students for this role. You're competing against me and ACE. And, you know, um, I think now in my career, I'm more senior. So I, I don't really apply to the junior roles anymore, but early on, right. I, I, I had two ship titles and was still trying to get into narrative, right? So, you know, um, it's going to be hard to stand out as a student in that regard. But game, level design in particular, I think lends itself, level and tech are the two design disciplines that I think lend themselves well to come, being able to transition into narrative design. And then, of course, writing. Um, I'm, I've actually mentored a few writers on, like, the difference uh, because a lot of pure writers aren't as... They think they're the same at first, and then they learn the difference, and then they kind of some of them change their mind, some of them double down. It's pretty cool to see that happen. Uh, but yeah, so okay. Uh, okay. Just to add on that a little yeah. bit, um, because if, before I just say that I was a student and I went straight into narrative tech design, I wanted to just kind of profess what uh, what my background is also within my uh, years of study, because both of my studies were. Um, purely practical studies. So I, every single semester, I was also making a game. So I was constantly uh, creating games. So my portfolio, by the time I graduated from my master's, was full of stuff. I'd by that point already done about probably twenty game gems, um, which probably helped quite a bit. Yeah, and for my first narrative design role, I got very lucky. Um, I did global game jam back in in grad school. Uh, and I mentored an undergrad um, at the time who was in his final year um, as a tech designer. When I interviewed at Respawn, he was on my interview panels. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, three three years down the road, right? Like, I had a, an easy in of someone who remembered that I knew what I was talking about, and that helped quite a bit. It's It's, it's an extremely competitive role. So for those of you watching, now you know you're in game game jams. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's your in if you want to get into narrative design. They get that experience. Definitely helps. So then, can I ask? I mean, because you're talking about narrative design being kind of like an end goal, then. So does anybody ever move on from narrative design to hmm. a different role in the company? I mean. The two the two types of moving on I've seen from narrative design are moving to like director or like lead roles where they're doing a lot less of the narrative work and more of the people management. Like as a lead, uh, narrative director they tend to do more of the the like story direction stuff. Uh, but like as a narrative lead, you're, you're more of a manager than you are an actual implementer. Um, so that's one type of moving on. The other one I've seen is retirement. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So in other words, no, this is I, an end goal. This is for a lot of people, yes. Yeah, and I have to add on that. No, no, same thing. You've noticed? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't actually noticed anyone uh, leaving it, so I, I have nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's interesting enough in itself, isn't it? So because there are not many roles where that's not common. So yeah, yeah, or where that, I, yeah. I think this is a role where people really want to express their creativity, and it's a role that touches every part of the game development process, especially as a tech narrative designer. So you're touching code, you're touching art, you're touching audio, you're touching mechanics. Um, you are in every part of the game development cycle, sometimes even marketing. Um, you know, you might they might come to you for like uh, the the story highlights or something like that, right? So because it's so in, engaged in the cycle, I think once you have that position, it's like, I get. To, why would I go and only do a part of this job, you know, when I can do all of it? Hmm. 
but it, it also sounds really complex to me because you have to touch so many fields. Like, can you, okay, this is going to sound a little harsh and I don't mean it that way, but how do you perfection each of those fields that you touch then mm. when you have, when you are doing all of them? That, sorry, that just like popped into my head and it was not meant as a criticism. I'm just thinking you must be so overwhelmed. No, because I think it's, it, it's, yeah. it's, you work with teams, right? And so you have people who are experts in their field. And like, if I'm working with audio on like a uh, audio treatment for video, for example, I'm not going to tell them how to do their job. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I don't have to be perfect at, other roles i have to be good at communicating what narrative needs to make it work and trust that the other people are also good at what they do oh that's such a good answer or the oh oh thank you for that thank you and and how about you ace it's hard to compete with that answer but uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean generally in my when i'm doing my job i don't strive for perfection with every step that I take. I just take a step and then I iterate and iterate and iterate until it's as close to perfect as it can be. Uh, but I I never intend for perfection with the first first look at whatever I'm doing. Uh, that, that would just drive me insane. Is there anybody in your company? speedrunner breaks it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Does there and is there anyone on your team that kind of that you work closely with that kind of chaperones or the watches and then you guys kind of collaborate with each other, or how does it work? You like deliver a product and then you give it to like the art team and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I've worked on, and then they're like, okay, let's fix this a little bit, or or what 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 do you have? Do you not have that problem? Um, well, for me, I mean, we have like it's within the narrative team since I work with them very closely uh we have our lead writer and i answer to our lead writer she kind of has the final say on anything narrative related but tech related i go to other people for uh anything related to that and that would be our lead programmer or the um, um i don't remember what his exact title is but he's the tech part of the level team um so it, it differs on what I'm working on and who I'm working with, but I tend to collaborate a lot with all of the teams uh, in mm -hmm. some way. Uh, it just depends on what I'm working on, really. But that's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, and for my part, it's it's a lot of, like, I write specs. I'm like, hey, these are the requirements we have. And then I kind of hand that off to whatever team is responsible for fulfilling that. So if we need concept art, uh, you know, it might be a character bio. Um, and oftentimes that's like the writer doing most of the heavy lifting on the bio and me just being like, okay, this is working with what we're doing. Uh, like recently I worked on a, a spec for a feature that we're looking to implement in our project and then went over to the team. I'm trying to be very vague because, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I wrote out the spec, sent it over Slack, uh, a link over Slack and was like, hey, can you, you know, does, this is all the information that you need. And sometimes they'll just come back with like a, oh, I have questions about this. I don't have enough information to fill this out or to to build what I need to build. Um, can you give me more information here, here, and here? A lot of kind of that um, when it comes to collaborating with other teams. Um, the only time I feel like I don't necessarily seek out as much information or or communication is when I'm doing my own writing. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, I tend to just do the writing and then send it out for to the to the writing team to say, hey, does this line up with the tone and the themes that you are creating uh, on your end? That that's honest. That's so interesting. That's so interesting to hear about and that the, the amount of collaboration you have to do with so many of the different teams is really interesting to hear about. So I gotta ask you then big general questions on what are some important things that you think that we should know about working as a narrative designer? Hmm. What's the big thing that everybody should know when they walk away from this stream and be like, oh, that was such an interesting stream and I learned so much. This is what a narrative designer is or does. 
this one's not like a exciting one, but it is a reality. And I think a lot of narrative design, aspiring narrative designers don't realize this. And I, it's really important. Um, when you, especially in AAA, when you're on a AAA game and you're a narrative designer, you're not creating the story that's getting told. <laughs> um, mm. It's, you're creating the experience of how the story is, got, uh, how the player interacts with the story. Um, but when it comes to the actual narrative and the um, like the high level story beats, usually a narrative director and a creative director are managing that. Sometimes a lead, and as part of the team, you will have input and be able to give feedback and and work with writing to be like, hey, maybe we should try this instead of this. And I think this is more thematic. What we're going for here's our you know lines up with our pillars in this way, uh, but usually you don't own the story you own the pl how the player experiences the story as a narrative designer okay that's really interesting any any thoughts yourself Ace? i think that was a very good answer um i think i think the only thing i'll add is that uh learning how to uh both how to cope with and how to use spreadsheets is very important. <laughs> cope with spreadsheets. <laughs> it's something I'm still trying to cope with, but uh, it, it is an inevitable part of uh, narrative design, it seems. Um, inescapable. Are you Okay, I, I have to ask. Are, is it like spreadsheets for dialogue? Of course. Uh, after this stream, I'm going to introduce you to artists. I, I sadly I have already uh, looked into it. Um, oh, okay. But uh, for the current setup, uh, Fair enough, spreadsheets. Fair yeah, yeah. Uh, My you, first so project you... was also in spreadsheets. I get it. Yeah, and it's a from what I've heard, similar in a lot of big studios that don't have uh, uh, middleware in place like Artisy, um that can just automatically generate them for you. Um, and not so small uh, small companies usually don't have the budget to uh, create tools to generate them. Mm. Uh, at least uh, we don't have it at the moment. Do you use one, or uh, do you? Oh no, I can't ask that. Do you have a tool that you would recommend using, Jurari? Um, depends on how much money you have at your disposal. Mm. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been looking and, and trying to get a demo for Gem by Backlight, which is the company that used to make Celtex. Um, and it looks incredible. Uh, its interface is very screenwriter friendly while also being very supportive of branching narrative. The problem is it's very expensive. Um, Artisy is another tool that I use in my personal project and I really like its flexibility as a design tool. Um, there, I have my naggles with it, but whatever tool you use, you're going to have naggles. Nothing's perfect. Um, but in, in general, I find it to be a very useful software uh, with the ability to do robust searches and and uh, find text very quickly and easily. And then it has a direct import into both Unity and Unreal. So you just push a button and all your dialogue's in your engine now. And you can find it by reference instead of having to have a spreadsheet and remember index numbers and stuff. Sounds like a lot of help other than a spreadsheet or more than a spreadsheet. <laughs> spreadsheet sounds cruel. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in our but case, it, yeah. the spreadsheet is more of an add-on to mm -hmm. uh, other proprietary things we have uh, that I can't talk about. Oh, one of the, sorry, one of the, we got a question that was asking, what was the second tool you mentioned again? Artisy. So first is Gem by Backlight. The, the second one is Artisy. Uh, Arc Weave is basically Artisy, but on the cloud and web browser based. So that's another one. Um, and then Ink is the last one, but that's more like markup, but it is a f tool. So. Okay. So Artisy. Artisy. And yeah, as what you mentioned. Because um, we have our producers been uh, linking some of the tools in our chat now for other people gotcha. that they might be interested in in looking up the different tools. Thank you for that. So, okay. Are there any misunderstandings about narrative design that you know of? Other than my my lovely one at the start, which is it's the same thing as a writer, right? Any <laughs> other common <laughs> Are there any other common misunderstandings? 
I mean, I think you already commented on it uh, in the previous question with the yeah. uh, the ownership of the story, uh, which is, I think is also a big misunderstanding uh, with the narrative design role. I don't really know of any others, to be honest. Yeah, I, th I think those are the two most common. Mm. Okay, okay. So do you have any, or we talked a little bit about before about your favorite part of uh, working as a narrative designer. Do you have any fun experiences or some a memorable time working on something that stuck with you? Uh, and would you mind sharing them? Yeah. Um, my my first one that comes to mind is in my personal project. So in my spare time, I work on a hip hop JRPG called Concrete Rose. How cool. And um, I, I set out to tell the story based on a dream I had, had no idea what, how you were going to play the story, but I knew I wanted to tell this story. And designing mechanics around that narrative, which is focused on how to navigate when it's appropriate to be to use peaceful means versus radical means as a, as a way to fight revolutions. Um, I, I found that the mechanic designing mechanics around that concept and then implementing them so that the story didn't feel dissonant with the the verbs the player was using in combat uh, was really fascinating, especially for the peaceful route where uh, it's a it's a turn based JRPG, so you, you take turns, but some of the mechanics are a little more unique where you have um, like record spinning and you have to line them up to do the peaceful option, and the radical option is just kind of winning like normal turn based combat. Mm -hmm. Um, no, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, I was saying that was it. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. For me, I I uh, also thought to a personal project or not a personal, but the game jam project I did with a few of my friends. Um, it was a uh, my friend that created a uh, dialogue system in Unity. Uh, just he just wanted to test out if he could, so he just made a visual uh, dialogue system, um, and we decided to try it in a game jam. Uh, I just remember it being the, it wasn't super polished back then, but uh, just, it was a very memorable moment for me when I created this monster of a branching dialogue tree for uh, for one of the characters you could talk to. You could talk to, you didn't even have to talk to him, he was just there. Uh, but you could talk to him for probably about five minutes about nothing. Uh, it was completely pointless dialogue. Or you could end it in one question or uh, one answer. <laughs> uh, I, I just spent way too long writing a huge branching thing for no reason at all. It's uh, great fun. Those are some fun parts about about game design. There are things that you or game development that you you end up doing things that you sometimes don't always expect, but that give really nice results or fun results. So okay. You work with a lot of different parts of your game studio, as as we mentioned earlier. What do you, what are, if you could give some, I wouldn't say advice, but if there was something you wish that you could convey to these other different parts uh, of the game studio, uh, uh, other roles that are in the uh, studio, what would you like them to understand about narrative design? Oh, that one I have, I, I have an answer ready for, actually. Oh, oh yes, um, please bring it. Specifically with with game designers, narrative is not there to make to like take away from the game design. It's there to enhance it and and work together. And I think some old guard game designers sort of view narrative as like intruding on their on the gameplay experience. And I think I think it's just the total opposite, right? It's they they, they work together in tandem. Hmm. That is really that is really good to share. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I have only have one one kind of gripe, which I've also mentioned to uh, people in the company. It's a. Uh, it's probably fine. I, <laughs> I'm wondering if anything of this is NDA. I'll, I'll keep it very vague, but uh, the. You know when you go back and polish up a certain part of a, of anything, you uh, 
perhaps uh, as an environment artist or something, and you move a rock and move it to a different place, and uh, just you know, you think it doesn't really matter. It's just set dressing. But the, the movement of these things breaks the narrative pacing of that area completely, because maybe you, that served a point as a bottleneck for two different points or anything that the uh, the narrative designer would have thought of. Uh, something that is never they didn't, never think of it really, or how like, it could break narrative pacing. That's uh, the main thing that popped into mind at least. Hmm. Do you have any advice for them? Like, just don't move rocks, or never, never move rocks. <laughs> yeah. Very simple. Rocks it's are there. Stone. Yeah, literally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. No, I mean, obviously, if the rock needs to be moved, it needs to be moved. Uh, it, it, it's nice to get notified of it if it does break something. Um, you know, uh, instead of finding it out a month or two later, uh, things like that. Have you had any similar experiences, Jorori? Oh, oh yeah. Um, I think it's it's quite common that people test their part of the game and don't think about how it impacts others when they're testing their changes. So it's like, oh yeah, everything I tried to do worked. And then if you have a good QA team, um, and narrative QA are some of my favorite people in this entire industry because they have to know the whole story inside and out and also do a whole other job, which is insane. Um, but you have a good QA team, they can catch that. But if you're in a smaller studio, that's not an option. And so communication is super important in that regard. So can I can I just ask a little bit about this? So if they wanted to communicate that they made these changes to you, I mean, I feel like if they moved a rock, it's a little hard for them to be like, so I was just doing my job and I moved a rock. <laughs> is this going to break the game? So like, how how would you... <laughs> how would you... Uh, like them to communicate like would it be like when they've uh, worked on a certain area or i think it's mostly if, if they worked on a certain area just uh, yeah. putting a message on uh, whatever messaging you use i worked on this area mm. uh this was moved or you don't even have to specify what you did uh uh because yeah it, it can break a lot more things than just narrative as well but uh it also just depends on everything uh, with the game or the how the studio works, how you would put that out, really. Okay. And I think uh, working closely together helps mitigate some of this, right? So, like, yeah, yeah. when I when you're working with the level designer, be like, yeah, we want to um, at on Jedi, right? We work very closely with the level designer and the writer, and we would do like um, playthroughs together, and be like, yeah, I'm gonna put a trigger value here for that line, and then the the Level designer's like, oh, well, I have like an event that fires that does this in the level after this, so I don't want to take. And it was a lot of back and forth, um, and that really helps a lot because then anytime so the level designer goes in makes the changes, they already know all the triggers that were set up, and so the, or you know whatever VO events we were worried about or story pacing things that we wanted to do, um, and so he could just flag me when he makes those changes, like, hey, I changed this part of the level. Can you do your magic? That's good to know. I actually, there's a, um, a question from our producer that I actually have the exact same question. Because, Jorori, you mentioned earlier that there is a QA that specializes in narrative design. I have never heard of this. <laughs> uh, so I feel like a, a little bit of an idiot. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Because we had a, we had a, actually a, one of these uh, talks about QA, and narrative QA didn't come up. I'd love to hear um, more about it. About I don't role. know if it's uh, it's specialized QA or just like QA that gets assigned to narrative okay. and happens to excel at it. I, I, I've never worked in QA, so unfortunately, oh, yeah, my, yeah. my knowledge of that field is limited. But every, uh, both Respawn and Housemark, we have a dedicated QA person for narrative. Um, and every time, they're just like insane how much they have to keep track of in their braid. And I'm always impressed. Hmm. Do you have one at Mirkur as well? Uh, we don't have a narrative specific one. Uh, oh, okay. We have uh, currently have one internal QA, uh, this is small team, mm. but she's an absolute beast when it comes to just anything. <laughs> she finds everything. <laughs> it is it is insane uh, finding things that none of us had ever thought of. Uh, I it's, it's uh, very interesting to see your work. <laughs> So all the love to to QA. Uh, Absolutely. QA yeah. yeah. I think they don't get enough attention. 
So we're going to round up a little bit now. And before we do that, I was wondering, do you have any words of advice that you would have for students or anybody looking to get into narrative design? Because since it's such a uh, desired job, any, any words of advice for them? Uh, I think I, the, the one big advice, because uh, at console uh, that I attended now, very uh, shout uh, out week. to console uh yeah. my conference that i work with yeah in, in norway i talked to a lot of students there as well and i pretty much gave everyone the same advice do a lot of game jams mm. and if you want to get into narrative design create narrative uh narrative driven games uh, during the game jams entirely possible yeah, my advice is uh, kind of similar. You know, I think there's a lot you can do in Twine as a solo uh, narrative designer that shows off like your understanding of the craft, and that's a really good place to start building a portfolio. Um, obviously, you know, building visual novels is not the same as building a AAA experience, but it's a good way to show you have chops in. You know the creative writing aspect, and the and the pacing aspect, and the mechanical aspects. Um, and so, I usually, when if someone's like, "Oh, I want to be a narrative designer," what do I do? I'm like, "Have you built anything in Twine or, or any experiences? You know, in Unity, if you know Unity." Um, and if the answer to that is no, that's where I tell them to start. If they have done a little bit and are trying to break in and struggling with the kind of entryway into that. You know, um, a lot of what I'll tell them is uh, make sure you're having your portfolio, your portfolio and resume looked at by people who are currently doing this, so they can give you kind of what worked for them. Um, and I do a lot of portfolio reviews. Um, and then this one's a little—it's eh, kind of hard to like for, to like tell people, but I think it's really important. Um, you know, ask yourself what is a reasonable amount of time to try to make it as a narrative designer exclusively and at a certain point if you're struggling maybe look into a side discipline or like tech design or level design and then come in the back door as i you know right like get yourself in the industry first then worry about what your what role you're going to be doing while you're here mm. thank you thank you for those that that advice we actually have another question uh, related to what you say, would you count experience in making short films as a good way of entering narrative no. design as well? No. Okay. No. Uh, I, look, I I love a good short film. I did one of the short film challenges in college. I think they're great. Um, but the world of film and the world of games are so dramatically different. And I have watched in like um, recruiting, like interviews and processes and stuff, a lot of talented filmmakers get rejected because they don't have any experience in, in, in the interactive side. Granted, if, if you're making an interactive film, like a Bandersnatch type deal, now you're cooking. But unless you're doing that, it's it's just such a different medium. Yeah. Or if you're making a short film in Unity or Unreal, it might be applicable, but it's... Yeah. Okay. All right, so I wanted to thank you both so much for joining us tonight. And um, before we head out for the night, I was wondering if you had any uh, anything you'd like to promote, whether it's yourselves, your companies, your games. Do we give a little shout out in the in the chat for everybody to take a look at? Sure. Uh, so you can obviously follow me on Twitter. My my user handle uh, J Rory. So a little pun on my name there, and. Um, you know, I'm working on this hip hop JRPG that I mentioned earlier. I would, um, it's just like a, a side project, not anything special, but it's. I'd love for people to come and play test it and tell me what they think about it. And you know, if you follow me on Twitter, message me, I'll send you a link. Fantastic. Yeah, um, that's for me. Um, my handle is uh, Ancree on everything, um, Twitter, uh, Blue Sky, um, probably some other things as well, and also on Ancree.com. You can find other social links. Fantastic. 
we will link them as well for you uh, in the chat uh, so that people have a way to find you guys as well. Um, before we go, usually we, we ask our speakers if they have any topics that they think that we should cover the next time because we've, we've, done, we've done marketing, we've done QA, we've done game jams, we've done tech art, um, we've done producer roles, uh, we've done schools and education and game development. Uh -huh. Is there any kind of role that you think is maybe not as well known in the industry that we that you think we should look at? Um, you know, it might be worth exploring the difference between a concept artist and a and like uh, you know someone like a character artist, right? Because those those can be very different roles. A character artist might be making like actual sprite sheets or even three D models. Versus mm -hmm. concepting, which is just like the idea that's going to go into that, um, that might be worth exploring. Definitely, thank you. Definitely. I can't think of anything at the moment. Uh, no, I don't, no, we, we don't have that many niche roles uh, at our company other than mine, really. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I got nothing. No, but that's 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 totally fair. So, but thank you guys both so much for joining us today. It was really interesting to hear about the role, and hopefully, I will be not be making the same mistake again when I say, "Oh, narrative <laughs> designer, oh yeah, they write the game, don't they?" Mm. Uh, so, thank you both so much, to Rory and Ace, for joining us, and thank you to everyone watching uh, for joining us, and thank you also to our producer in the back, Vivian, um, for for taking care of us today. So uh, we're going to round this up and say thank you, and I hope you all have a wonderful night tonight. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.